Let's face it, parenting is the most important job on earth. Every day presents a stack of different challenges, and more often than not, the answer is outside of the box. On this podcast, we will offer proven strategies, interview pioneers in education, give insights into how to be successful parents, and even share our imperfect experiences of being parents ourselves. We're all in on this journey, and we will span the globe to find out what is working and who has the answers. This is the Sound Foundations for Parenting podcast. Here are your hosts, Darren McCarthy and Brian Powers. Welcome to the Sound Foundations for Parenting podcast. I'm Brian Powers. And I'm Darren McCarthy. Darren, today um, we have a very special guest, someone that, uh, that you know from, from your past and, and uh, is definitely a wealth of knowledge, Mr. Bob Doman. Yeah, I, I've been following, I've been hearing the name for years upon years because I, Gail, you know, Gail Morris is my mentor and she was trained by Bob Doman. And in the uh, Doman Delicato meet uh, concept back in in Southern California, so it was it's amazing that like there's such a small world of people that think along the lines of development and child development and and um, going to the foundation of, of of kids' issues, and he's one of the founders. He's one of the pioneers that created the whole concept and the National you know Association for Child Development. So I. I think that was kind of rare and, and, and great for us to be able to get somebody like that on. Yeah, it was, I mean, we had his son Alex on um, a few episodes ago to talk about, you know, his li- listening program. And, and it was very uh, generous of him to, to reach out and introduce us to his dad um, and, and his brother Laird that, that helped facilitate all this. And, and Bob was great. I mean, he really, we talked a lot about just what you said, developing foundational skills. Yeah, I mean, he, we when we we had a pre previous conversation just sure. to kind of get a feel for where we were going to go, and we were talking about you know he was he was talking about homeschooling should be called home education. Yep. Because because that that concept of education is really, as a teacher, one of the things we learn about is there's a there's a teachable moment, and there's teachable moments that happen every day everywhere around us. And, you know, and he started breaking it down into, you know, a whole series of things that we should be doing right now. And I don't think anywhere on that list was, uh, you know, a scavenger hunt to find uh, historical, no. you know, things for our <laughs> curriculum based homework, you know. And I think, I mean, I want to say that like the school, we understand that they do the teachers, 90% of them work their tails off. And, and they do a great job and they couldn't care for our kids more than they more than they do. But also, they come from a system that, in a sense, is kind of broken. Yeah. You know, and, and, and no one's really looking at the engine of it to say, yeah, it's, it, it's, it's, it's got to be repaired. I mean, I go back to when I, when I taught, when, when I learned before my student teaching um, at a really good, you know, educator school that we were going through basils, which are, you know, in layman's terms, it's like a book that tells you exactly what the lesson plan is going to be. Here's your objective list, which will t- what you'll teach. And it was like, I thought it was the greatest thing because I'm not really that organized. And I was like, hey, teach this. <laughs> but but the, the concept is so different because school is so focused on curriculum or the what we learn versus processing and, and, and the how we learn. Yep. And and this is what he's all about. So he has these, you know, these seven gems or six, five or six gems that he throws at us. And you and I are writing diligently with a yeah. paper, you know, and, and, yeah, and now yeah. we got stuff to do. <laughs> I said to him, like, give us something, you know, we're all home and the, and we're now the, the teachers and we should be the teachers, you know, the original teachers anyway, but now it's been reinforced more than ever. And, and he, um, I like, you know, the, the analogy I can equate it to is like, you know, you got to build that solid foundation before you put the house up. And if right. the fa- foundation isn't solid, you know, and, and that's really what he was talking about. Uh, and, and, a, and a love for learning. Like, wh- exactly. why did we, how have we stopped about, you know, we stopped talking about the passion to learn and, and the, the joy of reading. Yeah. And, you know, and it's like, we're such a market, marketing driven sales oriented society and words are important. Yep. You know, and we're, when we say home school versus home education, that's a big differentiator, you know, and we say, go, you know, do your reading comprehension 
versus go read something you like. Yeah. You know, that's a big, I mean, when you say reading comprehension, man, that's uh, just like everybody just kind of takes a get breath anxious. back and they're like, oh. <laughs> you know, but, if you, but if you give them, you know, something that they can enjoy and, yep. and that's just part of their lives, all in. Yeah. He, so I love the message. Yeah, I think it's vital. Teach them to love whatever they're learning. Absolutely. Simple, but I think, you know, I definitely forgot it. So, um, no, this was a great episode and, and let's get into it. Here we go with Bob Doman from National Association for Child Development. Welcome, Bob Doman, founder and director for uh, the National Association for Child Development. Bob, we're, we're really excited to have you. Uh, please give us a little bit of your background and, and, and talk about the organization. Oh, it's, it's a pleasure being with you guys. Uh, background, uh, simply I've grown up in the field of child development rehabilitation. My father was a physiatrist, which is a specialist in rehabilitation. Uh, I started off my career as a special education teacher, uh, developed some methodologies very early on, and at the ripe age of 23, uh, became the clinical director of a large United Cerebral Palsy organization, a private special ed school, and was in charge of all the therapy, all the educational programs, all the clinics. Uh, spent a number of years there and then started working internationally, uh, worked in Spain, worked in Israel, and in 1979 uh, began the National Association for Child Development. Uh, we presently have chapters around the United States, chapters internationally, and work with kids from all over the world, from kids with severe developmental problems to gifted and talented. And so the the full, the full gamut. Yeah. Uh, we work with a whole child, which is significant to us, which means that we, d we believe that you can't work with pieces of a child and do the child justice. So if you will, the only way we'll work with families is if we can work with the whole child. All right. We want to know what they eat, how they sleep, you know, what they do with their spare time. And we want to be working with them educationally, developmentally, therapeutically, the, the whole nine yards so that we can establish priorities, uh, see where the, the, the big issues are, focus where we need to focus, and accelerate their development and education as much as we possibly can. Brilliant. Yeah, I know Brian and I, have, uh, I, I keep throwing the word around the gestalt. And, uh, and it usually comes with a little moniker, you know, it's, you know, working with the whole child. Um, and then we do talk about child development. Um, can you give us kind of a perspective of, of like a difference between a parent that's looking at education where there, there's tutoring and curriculum versus what you do when you look at, at the, you know, the development and child development and <clears throat> more of a hierarchical approach? If, if you look at development and education, with an understanding of the the foundation uh it takes it, it takes on an entirely different perspective and look and feel all right so if you will that foundation is number one all growth all development is a reflection of neuroplasticity okay. how the brain develops is a direct reflection of the stimulation and opportunities we provide the brain and if we understand neuroplasticity, it tells us we need to be very targeted in what we do. We need to not only be targeted, but we need to supply the specific appropriate input with a sufficient frequency, intensity, and duration to, in fact, change the brain. All right? So if you will, there's a lot of implications there in terms of how we teach and how we educate. Mm -hmm. On top of that, we layer in your ability to process information and think is a reflection of your short-term memory, working memory, and if you will, your executive function. And I think it's tragic that virtually nothing is done in traditional education to address that foundational piece. I mean, if you will, we have the ability to make virtually every child smart, mm -hmm. you know, and, you know, 
everyone knows it's easier to educate a smart child than a child who's not so smart. And it is not very difficult to make virtually every child smarter and a better learner and an easier learner. So if you combine neuroplasticity with building the foundation of short-term memory, working memory, executive function, and say then we build the educational experience around that, it's a very different picture. It feels very different. And if you will, the outcomes are dramatically different. So, so the, the, the approach, obviously, is <clears throat> dramatically different. Um, and it would look different for parents as well, right? So I know you guys do, a, a, you talk about the Gestalt and working with the whole child, but you have a pretty extensive assessment system as well, correct? Well, we do a developmental assessment and identify any developmental weaknesses that we need to address. Uh, you know, and, and, and that's significant in terms of, you know, our job is to put together the whole package, mm -hmm. if you will. And, you know, we, we constantly remind parents that our job is to help your child become a successful, happy adult. And we don't want to be carrying any baggage we don't need to have. All right. If we've got some issues and we can address those issues and we can fix those issues, let's do that. Right. Well, I, I, always, I always think it's interesting when you talk to parents and they, they go through what the, the, the IEP process that we've, you know, we've talked about on the, on the show. <clears throat> and and it's, the whole approach is kind of like, well, I just want services for my child. I just want them to do everything they can do. And I think the thing that gets missed there is, is even if you got to be careful what you ask for almost. Yeah. So you do all this assessment and then you find all the challenges and then there's nothing that actually addresses those things. And I know you've, you've developed, you must have had a lot of, um, uh, how you say, rolling up your sleeves <laughs> to learn um, and to do things because that they, they weren't really in existence when you started, correct? These no, programs they, they, and strategies. And no, they weren't. Matter of fact, the, if you will, the perspective didn't even exist that you could change a brain. Mm. Wow. Yeah. And if you will, if we look at education as it exists, that really still underlies it. You know, if, if you, you know, if a, if a child gets an assessment entering school and has perhaps some special needs, essentially that child gets labeled as what he is on that day. Mm. And that is what determines the future educational program for that child. If you will, the perspective is we are going to provide an appropriate education for that child as he is. Mm. not to help change that child. All right. You know, it's, you know, the child's got ADD. Well, let's fix that. All right. He's got ADHD. Well, let's fix that. The child has dyslexia. Let's fix that. He's got a learning disability. Let's fix that. All right. All of those things are generally easily addressed if we address the specific underlying problems that unfortunately gave them that label. Right. Interesting. But the system as it exists does not really identify the underlying problems or even pretend to address them. It's so almost that bad. it's almost that band-aid on a broken leg kind of <clears throat> uh, reaction. Absolutely. That, yeah. It, it's, it's you bring up an interesting point there because you we know that the child like if we're doing our work rolling up our sleeves and doing what needs to be done, the child will progress. But then when they get to the next level, you're going to need to change everything and tailor. And, and just like you said, you know, frequency, duration, and intensity of a different type of approach because now the child looks different. So, you know, it's amazing to me, you know, we had an earlier conversation where it was kind of like, there's these almost like revelatory concepts that aren't even on the page when it comes to changing education across the board. So Brian, you know, um, Bob had this great idea that it's, we shouldn't be talking about homeschooling. We should be talking about home education. You wanna go a little bit into what your thought is there, Bob? Yeah, you know, I, I, think, I think it's sad when parents realize that schools are not doing the job for them. 
and bring their child home and replicate what the schools are doing. <laughs> that's, that's, that's tragic. Yeah. All right? mm-hmm. We have an opportunity when you bring that child home to totally individualize what you're doing for that child. You know, if you will, set curriculums are a necessary evil, perhaps, when you're trying to educate masses of children at the same time. The same time. All right. You know, if you will, we have a curriculum-based education. And everyone understands and knows going into it. But on the day that kid graduates, he's already going to have forgotten most of what he was taught. Mm. You know, I mean, please. (laughs) <laughs> you know, yeah. what is what is the logic of that all right right you You're know right. and we we all we all should know as educators that when we teach to the child all right and the child is into what we are teaching or we've gotten the child into what we are teaching the child remembers it mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. and i remember one of the old examples and they were talking about kids with learning disabilities and you know the kid who couldn't remember anything from school could tell you the batting average of everybody who played baseball for the last 10 years okay right (laughs) right so you know that says it's not that johnny can't learn it's that we have to turn johnny on to learning Mm -hmm. all right and make it possible for johnny to learn You know, in home education, we have the opportunity to develop superior processing skills, superior learning abilities, to turn the kids into accelerated readers, accelerate their math, turn them into readers, and individualize what we're teaching them, and turn them on to learners, and turn them into lifetime learners. Let's talk a little bit about, so now we're home. And I, I look at my current situation, a six and an eight year old, both my wife are, are working from home as well. And we've compressed their seven to eight hour school day into an hour and a half or two hours, mainly in front of a, a Chromebook. So how could parents that are trying to manage that and manage their work schedule, how could we bring, you know, start to develop the, the child to their uniqueness? The more you can individualize, the faster and easier it becomes. Mm -hmm. The better your child's processing skills, the faster and easier it becomes. Now, for example, we have children with Down syndrome who at the age of five are functioning academically on about a third grade level, okay? And that's with a reading program that maybe takes a total of 10 minutes a day and a math program that takes maybe 10 minutes a day. Hmm. Okay. Mm -hmm. That's what you can do when you can totally individualize what you're doing and target what you're doing to the child. You know, the further you get from one to one, the less efficient education becomes. You Hmm. know, for example, you know, if you take your two kids, and you want to sit and you want to read a book to them or look at a, a nature book with the two of them. All right. Well, you know that you can't target them both at the same time. There's enough difference between your two kids right. that if you're targeting one, you're boring the other. Yeah. Right? Yeah. You know, so, you know, think about a classroom with 30 kids and good luck. <laughs> right? You know. Yeah. I mean, not going to be. You know, we, we talk about teaching efficiently by teaching to the child's sweet spot. The sweet spot is if this, you know, if the child is at this specific level in math, we want to be just a tad above that. All right? Not way above it, not below it, just a tad above it. So we are constantly moving them forward rapidly. So it can be really efficient. Yeah, it's. <clears throat> I, I can definitely see it because the, the difference in the two of them, the six-year-old, you know, would would move much quicker than the eight-year-old, and that's that's a whole other conversation for another day. But <laughs> um, but yeah, it's it's being able to 
to tailor it to them individually, almost, you know, kind of like a, like, you know, a diet plan or an exercise plan, or even, you know, medically, it shouldn't be just one wipe of the, of the brush, uh, brush stroke for them, for everyone. Absolutely. And if you will, you know, looking into your situation, you know, again, if we're looking at just the whole child and perceiving the job is to help these children become successful adults, I would have your kids doing a lion's share of the cleaning in your home and a good chunk of the cooking in your home. (laughs) And I would structure it into their day. Yeah. All right, you know, and that's that does wonders for children. You know, if I had my druthers, I'd raise every child on a farm or a ranch <clears throat> with a lot, a lot, a lot of chores and responsibilities. All right, what that teaches is fantastic. And, you know, one of the tragedies of education today, is you've got kids in school for six hours, You've got them traveling for another half hour, an hour a day to get there and get home. Mm-hmm. All right. Then you've got an hour, two hours, four hours of homework. And gee, guess what? There's no time to do. There's no chores. Yeah. There's no teaching the kids responsibilities. Kid doesn't even know how to make his own bed. Mom still has to get him up in the morning because he hasn't learned to be responsible even for getting himself up. And yeah. we say we're providing that child with an education. I don't think so. And then we're scratching our heads when when they can't get out of bed to go to their jobs a yeah. few years later. <laughs> yeah, absolutely, and they think the whole world revolves around them. Yeah, and they don't have a yeah. sense of responsibility. Well, and you have to yeah. recognize the reality in this whole thing. I mean, your parents are typically not teachers, you know, and teachers are working with what they have. You know, my wife had a really good idea when this whole thing started. Is she said. Um, why don't they, the teach, the teacher has 20 in our school, they have 25 students. Why don't they just work with each student for an hour one-on-one and then, you know, it's manageable check in with the student the next week, as opposed to, I mean, we're doing scavenger hunts and, and, you know, basically anything they can get their hands on. And it's just not yeah. realistic. Uh, you know, one of the, one of the things I have suggested for public education is I think every child in high school should have child development classes throughout high school. Mm. And part of what they should be doing is spending 30 minutes to an hour per day at the elementary school, working one-on-one with the elementary children. Right. We could dramatically accelerate all of the basics educationally with that one-on-one time per day. Sure. Uh, yeah. You know, uh, one, one of the experiences I had when I was back uh, running that special school back in the, in the early 70s, I also ran summer programs, six-week summer program, the same school population, which was about 200 kids. During the school year, I had to have all certified special education teachers. In the summer program, I didn't have to have any teachers. And guess what? I didn't have any teachers. Hmm. I ran my summer program with junior high and high school kids who volunteered. And what was shocking was in six weeks, the kids typically made more progress than they did in the entire school year without a teacher. Wow. Wow. And uh, yeah, just to to have that here. You know, it's... it's, uh, (laughs) Because I and like I graduated from the state school system, um, and I got an elementary education degree. And what I thought was fascinating is that is this was in the you know early '90s. It may have changed now, but what I thought was fascinating is I didn't meet my first student until my senior year. So I'm thinking to myself, well, how? What about? I mean, I have a lot of nieces and nephews. I grew up in you know this ginormous family, you know. But what about the people that don't even know if they like kids? And now you're you know you're almost graduating. And that's exactly what you're saying here is, is, you know, give, give this opportunity to, to almost like reverse mentorship. Absolutely. Absolutely. And if you will, with that plan, you know, it's going to, that would make a lot better parents, right? That next generation of parents would be having children with having experience with children and knowing how to interact with children. 
which would be great. Right. I mean, you know, relative to home education, uh, it's generally easier for us to train a parent to be a home educator if they're not a teacher. Mm -hmm. All right, because we've got we've got a lot of negatives. Typically, we have to get rid of with teachers. Uh, you know, if you will, you know, one one of the things we we talk about with with parents and kids at home is we want to create a positive environment, which we define as four positives to every negative. Right? Mm -hmm. uh, aren't too many classrooms with four positives to every negative, particularly if you have a child with any issues. And, you know, just, just as a, a example, how many schools teach their teachers when they're marking papers to mark what is right rather than what is wrong. It does. doesn't exist. Oh. All right? So, I mean, what's the logic of that? You're communicating, gee, we don't really care what you know. We only care about what you don't know. Mm -hmm. All right? It's a good point. <clears throat> you know, when I, when I was teaching back then, I would mark what was right. I would erase what was wrong and let them then get that right. Yeah, no, that's a positive. That's positive reinforcement, and it. Yeah, you know what, what's fascinating about what you're saying is it seems so logical. Yes. Right. It just makes perfect sense, and so it's kind of like, well, why? Why is it revelatory? Why? You know, you've been doing this for fifty years. Like, why is why would we just changed it all to 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 be more logical <laughs> and you know simple? <laughs> you know, the education keeps replicating itself. Mm -hmm. I think there's a large percentage of professors in departments of education are graduates of that department of education mm -hmm. and <clears throat> keep doing the same thing year after year after year, you know, and, uh, you know, it's not accepted when, you know, when I started off teaching, uh, I had never taken a class in education. Mm -hmm. I had, I had, taken at every psychology course there was known to man, mm -hmm. <clears throat> but I'd never taken a class in education and uh, Pennsylvania actually gave me a teaching certificate without it. Mm -hmm. And when I went into teaching, not knowing how you were supposed to do it, I made my own way. And I actually took seriously that I was supposed to educate these children who were brain injured and cerebral palsy, autism, and Down syndrome, and mm -hmm. were emotionally disturbed. So my perspective was, gee, my job is to educate these children, and I need to find a way to do that. And the response of the rest of the teachers in the school was when they walked past my classroom, they would stop talking to each other. They say, gee, he, he's mesmerizing those children because they're behaving and they're learning and within two years, all the parents of all the kids in the school said, hey, we want you to do it Bob's way. Hmm. Mm. All right, which they rebelled against because it wasn't their way that didn't work. Sure, and that right there is, is the answer to your question. <laughs> right. <laughs> I think, you know, I think, I think ultimately when it comes down to it, he's not just talking about like somebody else's students. I mean, there, I'm sure there's cases that you can highlight that you've seen through the years that have been pretty remarkable. I mean, there's, there's remarkable, like, you know, if, if we talk about what most of our kids are doing, mm -hmm. you know, it's, it's, most people don't believe it. It's so shocking. Uh -huh. You know, I mean, I mentioned, you know, five-year-old Down syndrome children function at third grade level. You know, we could, you know, we see kids come in labeled, you know, LD, dyslexic, ADHD at eight, who are ready to go to college at 14. Wow. <laughs> All right. <clears throat> you know, kids with significant processing issues uh, who end up with very superior processing. Uh, I have one of my children today who I'm just trying to understand myself. <laughs> mm -hmm. This is a little brain injured cerebral palsy Romanian boy. 
okay, who at the age of five has processing skills that are unbelievable. I mean, to put it in perspective, uh, generally short-term memory is measured by a digit span. Right. And what is typical for an adult used to be considered seven plus or minus two. Today, I think it's six plus or minus two. Okay. It's regressed. It hasn't improved. Right. Uh, and actually, it has significantly regressed since the advent of most of our kids going to daycare and preschool. Right. Mm. So seven plus or minus two was considered normal. I think it's six now. This little boy has auditory and visual digit spans of 23. Wow. All right. And about 20 reverse. Hmm. Okay. <laughs> oh, and he does it in a foreign language. He does it in English. His native language is Romanian. Wow. Okay. That's uh, three phone numbers. <laughs> <laughs> the, pot the, potential, the potential of our brains is absolutely incredible. Mm. And, you know, it has frustrated me, you know, for 50 years that the educational community is not open to understanding and using this. I mean, we've gone into elementary schools. Matter of fact, we went into the lowest functioning elementary school in a poverty area of Ogden, Utah, where we were based. Mm -hmm. We took one classroom and we had to work for 10 minutes a day on processing activities with the kids. Mm -hmm. At the end of that period, those kids had advanced about a year and a half above their peers in the other classes, wow. academically. Mm. All right? We didn't do anything academically. All we did is worked on their processing. If you will, mm. all we did was made them smarter. Mm. Uh -huh. All right? And I offered to give the program work with the rest of the school and they declined. And, okay. Yeah. Did, did they give and I was, I wasn't surprised. It doesn't, you know, it, it's we're going to re require a, a total paradigm shift mm -hmm. for education to really get that the foundation of education isn't a curriculum. The foundation of education is all those brains sitting in your classroom. Well, and it's and it's true not just in the schools, right? I mean, it's it's like what I what I notice is there's a lot of like Sylvans popping up in Huntington Learning Centers and and all of these like private, you know, <clears throat> private expensive programs that are not going to the core, and just hitting on curriculum based stuff. So it's almost like it's a totally different mindset what you're talking about, and and it and it's going to take a lot. It would take a lot of marketing marketing efforts and getting the right language down. And I think it starts with changing homeschooling to home education. And um, I just want to reel back on something uh, that we, we've talked about a little bit, but I think we might have to um, break, it, break it down a little bit um, for parents. So when we talk about child development, um, you know, most parents aren't familiar with Piaget and all these, you know, these, these other, you know, st starters or the grandfathers of all this, the child development piece. Um, how does it, how does it, when you talk about child development with parents, how do you explain that in a, you know, kind of an elevator speech concept? Yeah, essentially, you know, what Piaget did was uh, identify at this age, kids do this, and then they do this, and then they do that. Mm -hmm. uh, he, didn't, he didn't try to change it. He just identified it, which was significant. Uh, once we know what the steps are, we can target the steps and more rapidly move the child through the steps and make sure we're not missing any steps and help the child develop, you know, an organized, efficient brain that works, works really well. Mm -hmm. right. uh, again, you know, you don't need to go through life with a bunch of inefficiencies. You know, I mean, life's tough enough without that. Right, right. All right, you know, let's, let's, let's go through this with the best equipment we, we can have. Mm -hmm. All right, and parents, parents get that. Parents understand, yeah, you know, we don't want to miss developmental steps. It's important to do that. And again, the biggest, biggest part of that is building the processing skills, the short-term memory, the working memory. 
Excellent. So, so when you when you when you address some of those challenges, um, what are the, some of the things that you you do? So, like, not to get too much into the weeds, but to, you know, do you do, you do <clears throat> movement based things? Do you know, sound sound therapy type stuff? Or well, if you if you will, uh, I'm actually second generation in the work, <clears throat> and my father and my uncle were the kind of the founders of movement relative to development. All right, and looking at children, <clears throat> children crawling on their stomach in a cross pattern, creeping, walking, running mm -hmm. in a cross pattern movement. Most of the movement things are based on that. Okay. Uh, sadly, I think that they, as often happens, people take a piece of information and build something around that one piece of information. Mm -hmm. So there's a lot of that movement stuff that goes way beyond what it needs to be needs to be done or should be done. Sure. All right. Just so they're doing something. All right. Uh, but if you will, you know, there, there's, there's the gross motor issues steps. There's fine motor steps. There's visual steps. There's auditory steps. Uh, you know, you mentioned the auditory, um, Early on in the 70s, I realized that one of my biggest weak areas was understanding and doing things with processing tones. Mm -hmm. And <clears throat> when I was working in Spain in the 70s, I discovered uh, Dr. Tomatis in Paris, who was the first one to develop sound therapy. And I was actually referring kids to Paris to work with him. Mm -hmm. And then when I moved back to the States, was working in the States, uh, we worked with some people who were trained by him. And we utilized virtually every methodology that had been created to date and found all of them rather lacking and developed what we then called the listening program, mm -hmm. which my son Alex has continued to develop through the years. Yep. Uh, after the listening program, we also started what we call targeted sound intervention programs mm -hmm. uh, that address things like figure ground and other auditory issues. So if you will, you know, these things are not terribly simple. Okay. Uh, you know, the people that I train to evaluate and design programs for children typically come with, to us with advanced degrees and it generally takes me three to four years of intensive training before I can let them touch a child. Mm. All right. And that's a typical child. All right. <laughs> and, you know, to get them to the point where they can do kids with significant problems, you know, we're talking decades. Mm. You know, it's, this isn't easy. And to really put together an entire program for a specific child you've got to know a lot because there are a lot of pieces to that child, you know, not the least of which is understanding and managing uh, compliance and behavior issues. Right. Sure. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. If so, you have, you know, if, if parents are home now and I, and obviously they're experiencing more of the learning at home, <clears> with kids, like, and they want to, you know, start to move towards, a lot of stuff we talked about here today, what's some good first steps or what would you recommend, um, you know, parents research or look into? All right. right. Right now for parents who have their kids home, the first place I would start is chores. Mm -hmm. All right. Mm -hmm. First educational step, structuring chores into your child's day and teaching them to do them properly. All right. Starting off with making their bed in the morning. All right, so you structure those chores in the day. You teach your child to to serve, to be responsible, to contribute to the household. All right, and if you will, free up mom and dad a little bit. Mm -hmm. Right, mm -hmm. you know I tell also tell parents, you know, you're allowed to give your kids the lousy jobs you don't want. <laughs> right. I got. I got. I tell you, I got an awful lot of kids around the world cleaning an awful lot of toilets. <laughs> you do it, and you do it well. You know. That's right. There's a no reason. Matter of fact, it starts with that, that, right? 
You know, a couple of years ago, I actually wrote an article, is your child better off learning how to clean a toilet or algebra? Uh, <clears throat> you know, in terms of the big picture, they're really better off learning how to clean a toilet. Sure. Fascinating, right? right? So we start off with chores and structuring chores into their day, mm -hmm. teaching them to be responsible for the chores. What that does to their self-image is amazing. What it does to their maturity is amazing. All right. It also teaches them something really important, which is intention. You know, if you look at most kids doing their schoolwork, they say, okay, what's the intention? Well, if you could crawl into Johnny's head, the intention is to get it done. Mm. The intention is to get mom off my back, my teacher off my back. Mm -hmm. Maybe it's to get a good grade, all right? Rarely is the intention to learn this as well as I can learn it as quickly as I can learn it, mm -hmm. okay? With chores, you can teach them that. Mm. And mm. then it generalizes to what you're trying to do academically. Right. So mm -hmm. that's step one. Step two is we want to turn, you know, well, we can't, we accelerate reading. But, you know, in the short term, at least teach your kids to love reading. Right. All right. You know, so you do shared reading with them. You find interesting, fun stuff for them to read. You re really reinforce that reading. Look at Brian and I. We both got our pens and papers. Uh, right. <laughs> <laughs> Keep on talking, man. <laughs> I got for recording this. <laughs> you, know, you, know, you know, speaking of teaching kids to love reading, you know, if you will, kids go into school. They're in school for six hours. They've got hours of homework. When do they even have time to have fun with reading and mm -hmm. read what they want to read? Right. You know, it's, it's, it's sad and it's stupid. Uh -huh. It almost turns them off. You know, it's, oh, it absolutely turns yeah. them off. Yeah. I can't tell you how many kids I've, I've talked to who had just graduated from high school, typical kids, who graduated with high school with good grades. And I've asked them, what was the last book you read? And they said, well, I really haven't read one. Hmm. Okay. You mean at all? At all. Yeah. No, you know how to go through school, you, you know, with cliff notes and looking up summaries, uh -huh. all right? Yeah. And didn't actually ever even read a whole book by themselves. Yeah. And it goes, it goes back to your statement before of they, they're doing it just to get it done. Yes. And get that, that check mark off and get the book teacher off their back. Yep. Wow. yep. Okay. That's number two. So you do that. The next step <laughs> is <clears throat> if you work individually on math, Targeting where your child is in a few short, sweet sessions, you, you, you can teach them new math processes in minutes. Hmm. You know, uh, as an example, my youngest son, when he was about fourth grade level, <clears throat> I was traveling most of the time, but I took over his math instruction. On the days I was home, I would spend about 15 minutes a day with math. That year, he went from fourth grade level math to 12th grade level math. Wow. Mm. Okay. 15 minutes a day. 15 minutes a day on, you know, maybe five days a week. That's, I mean, that's about how many times days I was home back then. So what's the, what's the key there? Is it, the, is it the tailoring because you're one-to-one -one with him or is it because it's, of your approach? It's one-to-one. -one. It's specific. The focus is on input. Mm -hmm. Okay. And the focus in math is on vision. If you will, math processes are steps. When you get a picture of the steps, you can do the process. Okay. Most everyone, you know, if you think about it, put yourself back in, in a classroom and a teacher standing on a blackboard teaching a new math process and talking nonstop. Okay, mm -hmm. and you're trying to pay attention. You're a good student. You're trying to pay attention to what that teacher is saying. All right. Yeah. And what you should have been saying is, "Would you please be quiet so I can see what you're trying to show me?" Mm -hmm. Yeah. Input, okay. input, input, input. Right. Input. Right. Books. And primarily with math, it's visual input. Yeah. 
you know, we have a whole uh, program, an ACD math program. And we actually, in the program, give specific words to use. Mm. All right. So you can teach subtraction and you only use three words. Uh, wow. All right. You're not talking in sentences and paragraphs. <clears throat> you are showing, giving specific auditory input only as needed. And it's amazingly fast and easy. That's it's, it's fascinating because I just did a one of my students was struggling with the B B D thing. Yeah. Yes. And uh, and I just I just started saying circle line first circle or circle first line, and now he's over yeah. it. And it's this has been three or four years where he's really been struggling with this. But that that language of intention and and directed language is vital to the piece. Yep. yep. Yeah. So. Um, we taught chores, we taught reading, we taught math. And the next thing is you have the opportunity to turn your kids on to learning. <clears throat> and it's as simple as finding a thing that's interesting. It can be as easy as you find a bug outside. All right, you start, you get, you, you know, you get on the internet, you find out what kind of bug that is. Mm -hmm. All right, you explore that bug, and when you're exploring that bug, you find other bugs. You find amazing things like dung beetles. I've got a bunch of kids who are experts on dung beetles. They're really cool. <laughs> All right? Yeah. All right? And, you know, you excite the kids. Wow, learning is cool. You know, that's neat stuff. So you've got the opportunity, you want to take the opportunity to turn your kids on to learning and stop making it such an ugly thing and such a chore and you're doing it for tests and uh, you know yeah it gets so loud stuff and it can be so nice yeah fantastic what a great message awesome no and then that that i'm sure will help because i know in my house it's like we're dragging them to the dentist every day when we go to sit them down at the dining room table to to do their assignments and it, it, turning it but on the days where where we're showing you know, interest in what they're learning and then also going it over, going over it with them and, and doing the reading with them. It, you d I definitely see a big difference. Hmm. I, I, you know, one of the things I teach parents, <clears throat> the first thing you want to teach in any learning situation is to teach the child to love whatever it is you're trying to teach. Hmm. Excellent. So, you know, if your kid hates math, your first job is to make math fun. And it may be initially, you only spend seconds on math and you spend minutes laughing and having fun and tickling them. Mm. <laughs> right? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So the next time you come in and you say, let's do math, Johnny doesn't, oh, I don't want to do math. I don't like math. You're going to say, yeah, let's do that. That's fun. Mm -hmm. right? yeah, absolutely. Yeah, a lot more. I know. Yeah. Good stuff. So when you work, when you are working with students, are you working in a clinic in Ogden or are you, or are you doing, working with parents around the world? How does that work? <laughs> okay. We, we train parents and then we coach parents. Okay. We don't work directly with any children. And we work with children all over the world. And sometimes we see them in person. Today, we see them all by Skype. Okay. Or Zoom. Yeah. Uh, but essentially, we do an assessment. Again, we can do it in person. We can do it with a parent's help and with little videos on our portal. We do the assessment. We design the program. We train the parents in how to do the program. We have a portal that has videos and instruction. And then they're assigned a coach, and we do a ton of communication. Any question, any problem, any concern, we want to hear about it and we want to address it immediately so we have we have parents who were talking to every other day at times occasionally in truth we talk them a couple times a day if they've got a problem we're trying to fix and address so we are incredibly targeted because of the level of communication we have so we do our our thing with the kids and the family every four months three times a year, and in between communicate. So every four months we do a new assessment, we do a total redesign on their program, but in between, a lot of interaction, 
modification constantly as needed. Awesome. And I see it. So, and I see it's a dot org. Do you have a nonprofit and a for-profit arm? We do. You we do. do. We have a, we have a, a foundation. Yep. Fantastic. Yeah. I hope you, I hope you plan on working for another 30, 40 years. Cause I'm just, you know, I think we're just starting to get a little bit of knowledge from you and, and I'm about to put you, put you up for a secretary of education. So, you know, <laughs> what a great message you have. And we, you know, we really appreciate you know you coming on and, and sharing this with us. And I'm not, we're not kidding when Brian and I are writing stuff down that means we're going to implement it right away. And I know our parents will be really excited to have things that they can actually do and, and kind of relieve the stress of, of having to deliver on all this, heavy curriculum stuff when we know yeah. summer's coming soon and this yeah. summer more than more than most we've got to be we've got to be doing some things that work on on foundational processing and so on and so forth because we've lost some time yeah you know by the way before you know one thing i should mention yeah we do have an online processing program to work on the short-term memory working memory called simply smarter <clears throat> and uh it's been a great tool. And one of the things we've done because of, you know, the coronavirus issue, uh, we've reduced that price by half. It was already low, but now it's super low. Um, so it's a monthly subscription and easy, easy and effective. Okay. So we'll be sure to put that in the show notes, Brian. Yeah. And, yeah. We'll definitely. Put yeah, it what, I mean, what a great thing to do over the summer for, for sure. I mean, I say over the summer, but I mean now. You know, let's, yes. you know, get, there's no, there's no, there's no time. You can't delay when you're going to be working on foundational things like processing. So yep. what, I mean, I would say in a heartbeat between this and the listening program, um, you know, cause Alex has offered the shift 60 program and, yep. and now we have the online processing simply smarter. You put those two things together and you really are working on things that, that are going to make them smarter, as you said. Yeah. What a, great, what a great, what a great tool. I'm glad that you, uh, yeah. Well, thank you so much for, really for, for taking the you know, opportunity for us. Yeah. yeah. My, my pleasure, guys. It was very nice to meet you. And I hope we, I hope we can help some kids. Absolutely. That's the job. Thank you so much. I'm done with that. You're welcome. Thanks so much for listening to this episode of the Sound Foundations for Parenting podcast with your hosts, Darren and Brian. Find them on social media at Sound Foundations for Parenting. And if you enjoyed today's episode, please leave a review and subscribe. And we'll catch you next time on the Sound Foundations for Parenting podcast.